In part two of our series on the Teladaba frescoes, we are going to take a look at the political situation that was bubbling up in Egypt during this time. My name is Callista. Welcome, and thank you for joining me on this journey into the ancient Nile River Valley. To imagine that the history of ancient Egypt is like one straight line with a beginning, a middle, and an end. But in reality, the region was composed of dozens of different dynasties, many overlapping and coexisting with one another. To make studying this history a bit easier, 19th century Egyptologists work to divide the chronology of ancient Egypt into periods. Periods marked by strong, central, stable governments are called kingdoms, and those in which there wasn't a central government or where the region was politically fractured are called intermediate periods. Our story takes place in the second intermediate period, somewhere between 1700 and 1500 BCE. This period was preceded by the Middle Kingdom and followed by the New Kingdom, As you may have already guessed, the second intermediate period marks a time when ancient Egypt was very divided. This map shows the power struggles in the region at the time. Note how the Hyksos, also called the 15th dynasty, ruled Lower Egypt and the Nile River Delta, with Avaris as their capital. Thebes, the orange region at the center, was occupied by what we would now call the Egyptian rulers of ancient Egypt, the pharaohs. These two groups were constantly butting heads as the Hyksos armies expanded their territory south, first threatening and then eventually conquering Thebes. The Hyksos dynasty would come to an end with the reign of Amos I, a pharaoh who rebelled and took control of Avaris, pushing the Hyksos kings back into the Levant. So where did the Hyksos come from? And what did Egypt look like under their rule? If you were an ancient Egyptian, the name alone of Hyksos would have given you a pretty good idea of who these people were. From this set of hieroglyphs, one can read Hekahaset, or rulers of the foreign lands. From 1900 BCE, Hyksos was the name used by Egyptians to refer to the West Asian peoples of the Levant, or Levantins, who generally belonged to modern day Israel, Palestine, Lebanon, Syria, and Jordan. Records suggest that Egyptians and Levantins were in contact for all of Egypt's history, and recent digs show that people from the Levant had lived in Avaris for over 150 years before the Hyksos came into power. Scholars have debated for decades over the specifics of how the Hyksos came to power in Avaris and have whittled it down to about three main possibilities. One, that the Hyksos invaded Egypt and took the region by force. Two, the Hyksos developed peacefully from the glowing Levantin resident population. Or three, the growing Levantin population enacted a hostile takeover within Avaris. For a long time, historians assumed that the Hyksos were these barbarian invaders that must have taken power by force. But recent scholarship now leans towards possibilities two or three. As rulers, the Hyksos had a blended cultural identity, taking advantage of both Egyptian traditions and their Levantin origins. While their royal titles, scribal activity, and religious habits were distinctly Egyptian, they still used the Near Eastern architectural style from their homeland and even kept the Hyksos title as a personal identifier. Furthermore, archeological evidence like religious architecture, burial practices, food, and artifacts all indicate that Tel El Daba was a culturally blended community with a large Levantin population. In fact, Avaris was a real hotspot for Asiatic immigrants, 
due to its role as the international trading hub of the Nile Delta. It was kind of like New York City, when most of your sea-based immigration is funneled through a seaport with a good location, you end up with a pretty popular melting pot. Exactly. That's a great analogy, Callista. It really helps root our distant research in the present. And it's amazing, actually, that between 1670 and 1557, Avaris was the largest city in the world. It would make sense, then, that cultural exchange was a significant part of the Hyksos dynasty, since they stationed their capital in the immigration and trade hub of the Nile. And this brings us to our focus of this series, the Avarice Frescoes. As Joe taught us back in the first video on this series, the Minoan-style wall paintings that once decorated the Avarice Palace are an exceptional rarity, since only a few examples of Minoan-style frescoes exist outside of Crete. But here, you have the capital palace of the rulers of Egypt being decorated with art that is explicitly foreign, not belonging to either the Levantine or Egyptian cultures. The question is, what was the motivation behind this? If the Hyksos were on a constant mission to conquer Upper Egypt, did they maybe just not prioritize the development of their own art styles? To make these paintings, were Minoan artists specifically brought to Avarice, or were immigrants from Crete hired to design the frescoes? Could the diplomatic relationship between the Hyksos and Minoans perhaps have encouraged the creation of these frescoes? And this theory is my personal favorite. Could these frescoes possibly have been painted to remind a Minoan princess of home after a political marriage with a Hyksos official? Whatever the reason was, clearly the Hyksos did not shy away from engaging with surrounding cultures and civilizations, and even actively sought out those cultures artistically. And I think we can all agree, the result is pretty incredible. Mm -hmm.